All right, I'd like us to turn, please, to 1 Samuel 28. <clears throat> I'm going to read from verse 3 down to verse 19. And we're going to look at a dark parenthesis, a very dark parenthesis, and really uh, examine Saul, uh, his last night on earth. And so beginning in verse 3 of chapter 28, it says, Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servants, seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul sware to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, what form is, is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am so distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me. And answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee, and is become thine enemy? And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David, because thou obeyedst not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord shall also deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Again, God will bless that very sobering reading of the word of God to our hearts. I mentioned this idea of a parenthesis, a dark parenthesis, because as you look at the text, you'll see the first two verses uh, talk about the armies of the Philistines coming together. And we just read them and then <clears throat> read chapter 29, 1, and we'll see how the passage just flows naturally and so this is really a divergence or a parenthesis look at verse one it came to pass in those days that the philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with israel 
And Achish said to David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle, thou and thy men. And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know what thy servant can do. And Achish said to David, Therefore will I make thee cape keeper of mine head forever. And then 29, 1, and really 1 through 11 just continues this whole idea. It says, Now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Aphek, and the Israelites pitched by a fountain which is in Jezreel. And so basically, uh, we have <clears throat> this parenthesis. And I said it's a very dark one. And uh, it's, uh, it's dark because it really uh, tells us about Saul's last night on earth and uh, the last activities of this man before he is to die in battle. And really, it's describing Saul's reaction to the Philistine invasion. Uh, it's really going to be set in contrast with David's reaction. For both men, the Philistine invasion posed difficulties. For David, as we shall see specifically next week, it was going to be hard for him because he's expected to go to war against his own people. And so he's in a bit of a, a, a hard place, a dilemma, in that he's supposed to be marching. The, the next king of Israel is supposed to be marching against the people that he is to reign over uh, in battle formation with the in ancient enemy of Israel, the Philistines. So he's in a hard place. But if he's in a hard place, Saul is in a very hard place because, as we shall see, uh, he's about to face the Philistines and there's no word from God. And so this is where we find ourselves, a very difficult place for both individuals. It describes for us one of three occasions in all of Scripture when God allows communication from the other side of the grave to be heard. We don't have, you know, like today, if somebody has a uh, one of these uh, death experiences, supposedly, uh, pretty soon within a few weeks, there's already a book published and they're on a speaking tour talking about it. Well, in scripture, there are very few occasions where anybody is allowed to speak from the other side of death. Uh, the three that we know of is this one, uh, where Samuel appears, and we'll talk about that. Some people wonder, was it Samuel? Was it, was it the woman impersonating Samuel? What was it? We'll talk about that. But I believe it's Samuel. Secondly, we have uh, that lovely passage, uh, again, a sobering passage in Luke 16, where we're allowed to see uh, conversation from beyond the grave, where Abraham, the rich man, Lazarus, all enter into striking conversation. And we're allowed, as it were, the veil is pulled back and the Lord allows us to see uh, what is it's like on the other side of death. And then the third occasion is Moses and Elijah on Transfiguration Mount. And these individuals come back and they speak specifically to the Lord concerning his exodus or his exit out of the world. And so those are the three occasions, of course, that's excluding the post-resurrection appearances of the Lord Jesus. But we're thinking primarily of uh, individuals uh, from the other side of the grave. And one of the things we're going to observe, because we're going to be thinking a lot about some dark subjects today, about uh, necromancy and all these things. And, and so we, one of the things we want to observe is how strikingly different the revelation from Scripture is compared to things that involve necromancers. Now, what do I mean by necromancer? I'm going to define a lot of terms this morning. A necromancer is uh, somebody who is involved in the practice of communicating with the dead, especially to uh, get predictions concerning a person's future. Of course, we're going to look at what really is going on in those cases, but that's what necromancy really is. And it, again, we're going to see how different the messages from so-called necromancers are with these messages that come to us clearly from the word of God. So <clears throat> as we dive into this passage, notice verse three, uh, it says, now Samuel was dead and all Israel lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. Now, the interesting thing is, why is the writer telling us this? Because we already know it. If you look back to chapter 25, <clears throat> you will see in chapter 25, verse one, 
we were already told this. And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. And so why are we being told the same thing again? Well, again, I want to suggest to you that the writer is setting in contrast between how Samuel's death affected David in chapter 25 and how Samuel's death affected Saul in chapter 28. How it affected David was, of course, uh, he, there was no counsel available from Samuel, but God provided counsel for David from another source. And we remember he provided this godly woman, Abigail, and she gave him wise counsel. And he was so impressed with that woman that after her husband died, he took her to wife. And so God provided an alternative uh, form of wisdom and counsel in the form of a woman. How did Samuel's death affect Saul? Well, he also seeks counsel from a woman. But oh, how different. <laughs> Not a wise woman like Abigail in the sense of the biblical wisdom, but actually a woman who supposedly had contact with the other world and uh, was involved with the demonic. And so what a contrast between these two men, the effects of Samuel's death, and the women that they sought counsel and advice from. Actually, David didn't seek it. It came and found him in the person of Abigail, but Saul sought it, and he went to this woman. And so it says, not only was Samuel dead and all Israel lamented him, it then says, uh, and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city, and Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. So this is an important little piece of information that Saul in his zeal had done something quite biblical. Uh, he had removed uh, those that were involved in the occultic practices uh, from the land, uh, executing the mediums, the wizards. Uh, and and um, part of the reason we're told this is it shows the level of Saul's desperation that something that he had previously put away from the land, he sought help from. That This is how desperate the man is uh, for, for some kind of direction, some kind of light, some kind of guidance in his crisis. And so David had a wise woman. Saul looks to counsel from a wicked woman. Now, we said that uh, Samuel, uh, when he died, all Israel lamented. And I, I want to just a couple of quick thoughts. We may have mentioned this before, but it's worth saying that uh, Samuel is really highly regarded in the word of God. In fact, uh, up to this point, chronologically in scripture, he is second only to Moses in the uh, way he is appreciated and revered by the people of God as somebody that was significant in Israel's history. And just a couple of scriptures that affirm uh, the, the worth of Samuel and the loss when he died. Psalm 99 verse 6 says this, Moses and Aaron among his priests and Samuel among them that called upon his name, they called upon the Lord and he answered them. And so along with Moses and Aaron, Samuel is put in the same sentence as those that called upon the Lord and uh, he answered them. And so one of the things we're going to see that stands out, and we, we said that earlier on, he was a great man of prayer. And if you remember uh, that he said uh, uh, that he would not sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for them. And so he was, uh, perhaps since the time of Moses, Israel's greatest intercessor in terms of praying for the nation. Uh, one other scripture about uh, this man, Samuel, Jeremiah 15 and verse 1. It says, Then said the Lord unto me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. And so basically judgment <clears throat> is irreversible at this point on the nation of Israel. And God says, even if the two choicest intercessors the nation knows of, Moses 
and Samuel were to intercede, it's too late. <laughs> uh, Israel uh, or Judah is going into captivity. But again, just a wonderful thing to think of how Samuel is remembered as a man who was a great intercessor for his people. And by the way, what a wonderful thing, how we need to pray that the Lord will raise up men of this caliber in our day, men who can lay hold of God in prayer on behalf of his people, uh, genuine prayer warriors, genuine men who have close communion with God and can speak to him on behalf of his people. Perhaps the close connection here in this verse between Samuel and Saul putting away those that had familiar spirits might infer that it was under the influence of godly Samuel that this crusade against those involved in the occult took place. If remember, he's a reformer as well. He wants to bring the nation back to God. And so perhaps Saul uh, was greatly influenced. In other words, maybe it wasn't out of personal conviction that Saul got rid of the, in his zeal, the witches and wizards and necromancers out of the land. But maybe it was under the influence of Samuel that he did those things. We can't uh, be sure, but that's a strong possibility, especially with them being linked together here. Now, I want to just think about scripture and what it actually has to say about these things. I'd like us to go back to Exodus. And one of the things we want to realize is the word of God does not subscribe to the tolerance mantra that we hear in uh, Canada and the US and Western civilization. Uh, toleration is not uh, seen as the ultimate virtue, which is the way it is perceived today, isn't it? I mean, the greatest thing you can be is a tolerant person. And the word of God is very different to that. And so let's just look at some of the scriptures. Exodus 22 and verse 18. How's this for clarity and simplicity? Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Okay, that's pretty strong language. Look at Leviticus, just to see that this is the uniform testimony of the scriptures. Leviticus 19 and verse 31. Leviticus 19 verse 31. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. So what it's telling us is that involvement with these who are involved in the occultic practices actually has a defiling impact on the people. And so they're to be avoided. Chapter 20, Leviticus 20, verse 27. A man also or woman that hath a familiar spirit, or that is a wizard, shall surely be put to death, and they shall stone them with stones, their blood shall be upon them. And then please, Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, the second law, the second giving of the law before they were to go into the land, after their years of wandering, Deuteronomy 18 and verse 10, there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that useth divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. So we realize that part of the purpose of the, the execution of the people in the land of Canaan was the fact that these people had become so thoroughly defiled by the occultic practices that were being peddled by these individuals. And that's the reason the Lord had driven them out from before them. And so just a, a, again, as a, as a practical note for, for all of us is we should never allow curiosity to cause us to be drawn in any attentive way 
to the dark arts or the occult world. Uh, we should be innocent concerning that which is evil. God has told us all we need to know about it, and that should be suffice for us. And don't get overly curious, because I do believe that uh, there's great danger in dabbling in darkness. So what are these uh, familiar spirits, for instance, that are mentioned here uh, in verse 3? Uh, familiar spirits. Kind of interesting. Familiar means something that is obviously something well known. And of course, uh, I believe that these were uh, demons that were uh, household uh, household demons that were uh, con uh, consulted uh, for guidance, basically, in family decisions. Uh, and uh, that's, you go to the, the Southeast Asia, and you'll see a lot of ancestor worship. And uh, these spirits that they constantly feed and uh, consult for, and they're so superstitious, every decision of life, even down to what color they paint, paint their house, uh, is it going to offend the spirits? And so this is the idea of these familiar spirits. And of course, we, we know they're demonic. They, they pose as ancestors. Uh, they're, they're very good at, at doing that. The Septuagint translation, the way it translates familiar spirits it uses a word from which our English word ventriloquist comes from. Isn't that interesting? So you know how a ventriloquist has somebody else's image, this doll or whatever it is, but somebody's projecting a voice to say it comes from this image. And so that's the idea that these ancestors, but the voice that's projecting it is coming from somewhere else. It's coming from the demonic world. And uh, I remember years ago, a godly, godly man that I knew who'd been a missionary in Brazil, uh, down in the Amazon amongst some of the most primitive people on the earth. And he would really have an issue with ventriloquism. And uh, part of it was because of his encounter with the spirit world uh, in the jungles of the Amazon. And uh, he would warn severely about even, even involved in something that's seemingly innocent as a ventriloquist dummy. Anyway, just an interesting thing. Wizards that are mentioned here it really means wise people or wise ones. And it would seem to have been a title given to them in irony because these people were involved in occultic uh, practices rather than seeking the living God. So it wasn't meant to be a compliment. Uh, in other words, it was facetious. These things, people think they're wise and they're looking to the demonic world rather than the the God, the creator of all, uh, how could that be wise? And so it was used in that way. So that, that's the meaning of these words. <clears throat> Sadly, Saul was not the last man to practice something he had previously condemned. Many Christians now teach and practice things uh, or against things that they once held dear. People who used to be in fellowship amongst us. And now they're involved in practices that are so different and uh, they, they're involved in things that they would have once condemned. And so Saul is not the first one nor the last one who has been guilty of practicing something that he had previously condemned. Paul in New Testament languages language puts it this way in Galatians chapter two. And verse 18, Galatians chapter 2, verse 18, I like the way he puts this. He says, <clears throat> for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. If I build again the things I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. So on to verse 4, it says, the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. So the Philistines are now in a very strong position to strike a blow at the center of the kingdom of Israel. Uh, where they are is uh, in a place where they're in danger of cutting off the northern kingdom from the southern kingdom and basically dividing the nation in two. They're also in that, that, that 
coastal, flat coastal plain area, uh, which is the main transport route in a place where they can use their chariots well. And so this is a very dangerous situation. And again, we think back to Joshua 13 and the failure to drive out the Philistines. And now it's coming back to haunt them in a big way. In fact, this is not just, as we've said before, not just some border skirmish, but this is a, an attempt to really to control the trade route through the plain of, of Ezrelon and to cut off Saul from the northernmost tribes. And Israel was weak and vulnerable at this time. Uh, and of course, part of the reason is because David wasn't commanding the armies of Israel. And secondly, um, the enemy knows when to exploit our weakness. And they're in a very weak condition. Uh, just uh, two hours, actually, from Mount Gil Gilboa, if they were to march immediately against them, they were just two hours uh, march from there. And, uh, and how is it that Saul lost control of the center of the land? Well, the reason is he was spending his time fighting the wrong enemy. He was chasing David instead of dealing with the real enemy that God had called him to fight. He's chasing David. And he's allowed the Philistines to gain strength and move into this central place where they're in danger of cutting the nation in half. In, in half. And so a genuine war is about to be fought and Saul is totally unprepared. In fact, it says when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart greatly trembled. And the language is so descriptive. It, it literally has the idea of he is paralyzed with fear. It's gnawing away at him physically, uh, incapacitating him. He, he's just in this state of being paralyzed with fear. And part of the reason is his disobedience had robbed him of boldness and confidence before God and his enemies. And it's always the case. If we're compromised uh, and if we're, we're disobedient, uh, we lose that boldness and confidence, both in the presence of God and in the face of our enemies, and we become very vulnerable. And this is where he is. The scripture is so clear, Proverbs 13, 15, the way of the transgressor is hard. And we see it very clearly here. So verse six, when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalm 66 and verse 18. There's no such thing, some would tell us, as unanswered prayer. And I think that's true. That even no is an answer. <laughs> Sometimes it's no, sometimes it's not yet. Sometimes it can be yes, but there's no such thing as an answer prayer. But there is something such as unheard prayer. Not unanswered, but unheard. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now, ironically, men generally resent hearing from God. <laughs> so uh, men scoff at the word of God. They mock the word of God, even in the scriptures. The Lord Jesus in Matthew 23, 37 talked about the fact that you stoned the prophets and those that came to you. There was a message from God is not always welcome. But there's one thing even worse than God speaking, and that is God not speaking, <laughs> not speaking at all. Amos 8 talks about a famine in the land, not of a famine of bread in Amos 8, verse 11 through 12, but a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. And one of the, the most sobering things of all uh, is the silence of God, when God has nothing to say. And so God has spoken in different ways, various ways at various times. He's spoken in dreams. We know that Nebuchadnezzar uh, we think of Joseph. God has spoken in dreams. He's spoken through prophets in, in Saul's own experience. Samuel the prophet has spoken to him. In chapter 10, 
uh, if you remember, he met the prophets and prophesied. He's had prophets speak to him, but not anymore. And then Urim. And of course, Urim and Thummim associated with the ephod. And if you remember, Saul had killed the priest at Nob and uh, command, of course, commanding Doeg to do it as his lackey. But Abiathar had escaped to David, taking the ephod with him. Now, I suppose that does raise an interesting question. Was Saul completely without any priest at all? If he had killed the priest at Nob and then driven. Well, there's another uh, line of priests. The priests that were killed at Nob uh, were all the descendants of Eli who were under, if you remember, the judgment of God. But there was another group of priests uh, who are going to have significant role uh, in the coming days in Scripture. So I want you to look at just for a second at First Chronicles 16 and verse 39. And it might at least imply to us that there was a priest available at this time. First Chronicles 16, verse 39, Zadok the priest and his brethren, the priests, before the tabernacle of the Lord in the high place that was at Gibeon. And so could, could it be that the tabernacle moved from Nob after the destruction of the priests and was moved to Gibeon and it, in, it was indeed Zadok in his family, because one of the things we're going to see uh, in Second Samuel uh, is that we have two different high priests seemingly at the same time. Chapter 8 of Second Samuel, verse 17. And Zadok, the son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, were the priests. And Sarai was the scribe. So you got Zadok, uh, Zadok and uh, Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar. And then if you look at chapter 15 and verse 24. And lo, Zadok also and all the Levites were with him, bearing the Ark of the Covenant of God. And they set down the Ark of God. And Abiathar went up unto all the people had done passing out of the city. Verse 29, and Zadok therefore and Abiathar carried the ark of God again to Jerusalem, and they tarried there. Verse 35, and hast thou not uh, there with thee Zadok and Abiathar the priests? Therefore it shall be that what thing soever thou shalt hear out of the king's house, thou shalt tell it to Zadok and Abiathar the priests. So it is a, it's a good possibility that Saul actually did have access to a priest, but it didn't do him any good because either way, God was still not speaking. There was no clear guidance coming to him. All that was coming to him was silence from God. We often use the phrase, the heavens were like brass. There was no word from God. And so it says, verse seven, then said Saul to his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there's a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. Now, some remarkable things here. First of all, isn't that amazing that one of his closest servants knew exactly the location of this mistress of a conjuring spirit? Uh, how did he know that? But he did. And then secondly, how come Saul doesn't go ballistic? Because it seems in the past, he was very upset that people were keeping information from him. And obviously, this man had known all along that there was a woman that had been missed. Uh, just look at chapter 22, first of all, uh, of 1 Samuel, and notice verse 8, Saul being upset. He says that all of you have conspired against me, and there's none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse. And there is none of you that is sorry for me or showeth unto me that my son hath stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. And so if you remember, Saul got really upset because people were holding secrets from him, particularly of the league between Jonathan and David. But now clearly one of his close advisors has a secret that he's kept from him. 
because Saul in his zeal had uh, tried to kill all of the, the, the necromancers and, and the wizards from the land. And yet his one knows exactly where one still is. And so obviously that's quite surprising. Verse 8, it says Saul disguised himself. It must have been difficult for Saul to disguise himself, seeing as if you remember when he was first chosen as king, he was head and shoulders above every Israelite. Uh, it's kind of hard to disguise that, I suppose. But anyway, he does disguise himself and put on other raiment, and he went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me up, him up, what I shall name unto thee. Now, this is quite a hazardous journey, first of all, to Endor. Uh, it was a hazardous journey, a journey of about 10 miles or 16 kilometers. It, in the dark, it's nighttime, and it meant passing the Philistine camp. It was actually behind enemy lines, four miles or six kilometers northeast of Shunem. And so Saul, in his desperation, the night before the battle, actually makes this journey. Uh, the fact that he wore a disguise and went at night says a lot to us. If we have to disguise our appearance, then we're probably doing something we ought not to be doing. If you don't want to be known as who you are, then you probably shouldn't be doing what you're considering you're to be doing. And uh, everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. John 3, verse 20. It seems like every shred of honesty and truth has gone from this man. Of course, the disguise is used for several reasons. One, not to cause this woman who knows that Saul has been the instigator of this purge of the which is from the land, but also his own troops. It would have been very hard to, for them on the eve of battle to see their leader walking out a camp and uh, with two men with him. Uh, and it would, might even give the impression that he was abandoning them to their fate. Or also, as he would have to walk past the Philistines, uh, <clears throat> Uh, it might also draw attention if he was wearing his crown and uh, looking like the, his regal majesty. And so the disguise had several purposes to it. Verse 9, it says, The woman said to him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he's cut off those that have familiar spirits and wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? She is rightly fearful of this mean a ruse, to arrest her and have her executed. And you can understand uh, why uh, she's very cautious. And here's the amazing thing. This is the most staggering verse, I think, in the whole passage, verse 10. Saul swear to her by the Lord, saying, as the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Now, isn't that a staggering thing? The Lord's name is introduced in some very strange places, but never more is it out of place than on this occasion. The Lord himself had said, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, Exodus 22, 18. And Saul now assures the woman in the name of the Lord that she would not be punished. Now, if that's not an oxymoron, I don't know what is. It's certainly a contradiction of terms. But it shows us a, 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 this, the mental state of Saul at this moment in his life. Then said the woman, whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, bring me up Samuel, the one man to whom he had been indebted since the time of his anointing. But I want to suggest to you that the woman doesn't bring up Samuel. This is not her incantations that do this or her skills in seance it's a bit like the story of Balaam do you remember how God overruled Balaam's usual incantations and all the rest of it and took over and I believe that's exactly what's going on here evil spirits may impersonate the dead but they cannot recall them from the spirit world only God 
can do that. And so although Saul asked her to do this thing, whom shall I bring up unto thee? He said, bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. Now, why did she do that? Because she knew very definitely that this was different to these demonic imposters of dead people she was used to dealing with. This is no mere demonic act of ventriloquism that's going on. This is actually Samuel. And she knows this is not what she's, this is, this is something that God is doing. And the king said to her, be not afraid for what sawest thou? And the woman said to Saul, I saw God's ascending out of the earth. Kind of interesting uh, because word there is Elohim. And um, so what, what really is going on? Uh, <clears throat> well, Kyle and Delish in their interesting commentary say, I saw a celestial being coming up from the earth or from the underworld. Uh, and so again, it's a, a heavenly being coming up from the underworld. And of course, the question is always asked, was it really Samuel? There are three schools of thought. One is that it was Samuel. Secondly, that it was a, uh, the woman pretending it was Samuel. And thirdly, that it was the spirit impersonating Samuel. Now, I would suggest to you that there's nothing in the narrative that would indicate anything other than this really being Samuel. For one thing, uh, her shock at seeing Samuel. Secondly, the fact that what Samuel says is the truth. And that is not something that comes out of the mouth of lying spirits. <laughs> and it would seem to me that this is actually Samuel that is allowed to come back from the other world. And so, <laughs> Most purported communications from the dead are vague and cryptic and couched in deceptive language, but designed to leave a favorable impression to the anxious relative trying to contact their ancestor. But I believe that Samuel had the unique experience of being sent back to earth with a message from God. And so he, he said unto her, verse 14, what form is he of? And she said, an old man cometh up and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. That mantle was so familiar to Saul. If you remember back in chapter 15, as Samuel left him uh, not to see him again, he grabbed Saul's mantle and it rent in two. And so this is very identifiable. And he told him that the kingdom would be rent him and given from him and given to a neighbor greater than him. So just as in the case of Balaam, God overruled the normal rituals of the false soothsayers and allowed Samuel to come back. And you can tell from verse 15, Samuel is not happy about this. He says in verse 15, Samuel said to Saul, why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? It's very evident that he didn't want to return to earth out of the, the underworld or, uh, I believe, paradise or Abraham's bosom. He really didn't want to come back. And of course, I don't think any true child of God, that's the other side of death, would want to come back to be uh, the other side Abraham's bosom, Old Testament saints, New Testament saints to be with Christ, which is far better. And so he, he doesn't uh, seem to appreciate being brought back. And he says, Saul answered, I am so distressed for the Philistines make war against me. And God has departed from me and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore, I have called thee that thou mayest make known to me what I shall do. So then said Samuel, wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee and is become thine enemy? And again, what a tr sad statement, really, that uh, God is now opposing this man 
rather than working with him, has become thine enemy, thine, thine enemy. Verse 17, the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. It's kind of interesting. Um, David, this is the first time out of Samuel's mouth that David is the neighbor. Now, it's very evident to everybody at this stage, uh, both friend and foe alike, that David is the one. But Samuel has never said that uh, when he was alive. He says it now from the other side of the grave. He says, even to David. And so he confirms this. But really, uh, seldom have more solemn words than those spoken by Samuel fallen on the ears of any man. Because his message to Saul is very sobering. He says in verse 18, Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. In other words, you basically are reaping what you sow. You sowed disobedience, and you're reaping a harvest now. And in fact, First Chronicles chapter 10 tells us there are really two strikes against Saul. This one that is mentioned here, and a second one. First Chronicles 10 verse 13, it says, So Saul died for his transgressions, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. So now he's doubling, it, as it were, his trespass in refusing to uh, execute the, the Amalekites like the Lord told him, and now in consulting this woman. Verse 19, moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel uh, with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel unto the hand of the Philistines. And so basically, this sobering message is that he would lose the battle. He would lose his life. He would lose his sons. He would lose his kingdom to another even David. And he had already lost the conscience now consciousness of the Lord's presence and the Lord's favor. And so how sobering. Now, of course, the big question that we've been asking ourselves from this whole passage is, is Saul, was he saved and a man of the flesh or was he a total apostate? And a lot of people would take the view that he is an apostate. And they'd say he lost the battle, lost his sons, lost his life, and lost his soul as well. And I think we're too quick to put people in hell. I really do. I would, if based, based on this, I would have put Lot in hell, but God doesn't. Uh, certainly Samson and Jephthah and a few others uh, I'd have confined there. And, uh, but the Lord seems to be a, a little bit more gracious than sometimes his people are. And it would seem to me that if we're going to be consistent, when he says, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me, there's two ways to look at that, either in death or with him where he is in paradise. Now, as far as Jonathan is concerned, where would you put him? I think we would have no question that he's going to be with Samuel in paradise. But when it comes to Saul, we're a bit iffy about that. Now, 1 Samuel 10, let's just look back there. 1 Samuel 10, verse 6, where I believe we read of this man's conversion, if you want to put it that way. It says, verse 6, The Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. Thou shalt prophesy with them and shall be turned into another man. Now, that seems to me the language of conversion, turned into another man. And then, we tend to use 2 Samuel 12 and verse 23. And I think rightly so, when a infant dies, just as in the case here, when David's child died uh, through uh, his liaison with Bathsheba, verse 22, he said, while the child was yet alive, 
I fasted and wept, for I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me and the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Now, that is not just simply saying that I'm going to die like he did. There's no comfort in that, that I'm going to die like the baby died. No, the comfort is that I am going to where he is. Implication is that he's in a place of comfort and rest, and David is going to go there too. And so to me, and again, I'm not going to break fellowship over it, but I'm a little bit reluctant to cast Saul into outer darkness. <laughs> and uh, I, I do believe that he is a perfect example of a man who was saved, but a man who was a perfect illustration of a man in the flesh. And the depths that a man given to the flesh can stoop to. And I believe that they can be quite severe. Now, we just want to spend a little bit of time on what we would call Saul's Last Supper. <laughs> and remember, it says in verse 20, Then Saul fell straightway all along on the earth. He was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel, and there was no strength in him, for he'd eaten no bread all that day, nor all that night. Now, he's just made a 16-kilometer trek through the night, and he has not eaten. He's been doing some intermittent fasting, and he's hungry. <laughs> uh, he hasn't eaten, and he's totally physically exhausted. And also, it says, he was so afraid. And again, the language is so strong that one writer describes Saul as a nervous wreck at this point, especially after what he'd just been told, hardly in a fit state to lead the nation into battle. And so this woman, she says, now therefore I pray thee, hearken thou also unto the voice of thine handmaid, and let me set a morsel of bread before thee. This is so typical Middle Eastern uh, understatement. Uh, let me just give you a morsel of bread, you know, a bit of bread. She actually is going to kill the fatted calf and make um, uh, unleavened bread as well. And I'd say it would be quite a feast, but that's very typical of kind of the way that the Middle Eastern would understate things. And so <clears throat> it says, he refused, verse 23, and said, I will not eat, but his servants, together with the woman, compelled him, and he hearkened to their voice. So he rose from the earth and sat upon the bed, and the woman had a fat calf in the house. She hasted and killed it, took flour, kneaded it, and did bake unleavened bread there, thereof. She brought it before Saul and before his servants, and they did eat. And you can just imagine what a contrast between another occasion where a fatted calf is killed. In Luke chapter 15, verse 23, it's in celebration at the return of the prodigal son. But this fatted calf and this meal, I would suspect, was eaten in gloomy silence. A condemned man eating his final meal before going to meet his fate. And it says, then he, they rose up and went away that night. And doesn't that remind us of another meal in John 13? And somebody who left the meal, and it says in John 13, verse 30, and he went out, and it was night. Kind of amazing, isn't it, to, to contrast. Now, just in our final minute, I want to just say, why, why have we gone through all this? Well, I think one of the reasons is it's, it's putting things in perspective. Yeah, David's dilemma is that he's about to, humanly speaking, march into battle against his own people, the people he's going to reign over. And he's in a fix. And God is going to deliver him from that fix. We'll see that in the next chapter. On the other hand, he is Saul. And he has got a much greater problem, putting David's into perspective. His problem is that God is not answering. There's no deliverance. There's no answer from God, just silence. And 
now he does get a word from God from an unusual source. And that is that he is about to finish his course. And what a sad, sad ending. David's dilemma with the enemies of God. Saul's dilemma without the word of God. David's deliverance is going to come by the Philistines. Saul's downfall is going to be destroyed by the Philistines. And so thus endeth a very sobering chapter. And again, let's learn some lessons. He that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he also fall. These things are written for our learning and for our admonition upon whom the end of the ages have come. Amen.